first question I want to ask you, I say, you know, hey, Doug, uh, you've been out of the day-to-day -day activities of the NEC and the Black Theater in general since around 1995. Uh, so tell me, what have you been up to between then and now? Well, at mid-90s, uh, I basically uh, went back to uh, my own writing primarily for uh, maybe five, six years uh, into the turn of the century. Uh, I was involved uh, finishing up my major work, you know, the Haitian Chronicle. Uh, and during those years, uh, every summer, you know, I went back to my hometown, New Orleans, after my father died and kept his old uh, raggedy sack uh, for the summer. Uh, and I would go there and uh, work primarily for you know, a couple of months uh, on the trilogy, the Haitian, you know, Haitian Chronicles, and uh, edited a lot of my other, you know, other, other plays that I had already finished. You know, the Clarence Thomas plays, which I wrote basically in the early 90s. As you know, my, the, the two first acts, the first plays of the trilogy, uh, Toussaint uh, Louverture, uh, uh, the first one, uh, and the second one, both of those two plays uh, were so epic and massive. I mean, they constituted about the, damn near 12 hours of theater between them. But the third play of the trilogy, was Dessalines, which was, you know, I did a 360 degree turn, and after writing these two massive plays with thousands of characters, I then went the opposite way and did a one man play uh, of Dessalines, who was my favorite of the uh, Haitian revolutionaries. Uh, and, uh, but it was a play I knew I had to do. Uh, as an actor by myself because it, was, it, it would be so controversial. So I had to do it at least first. I tried to get uh, a production of that done. I was close to getting that uh, video tape, uh, but uh, I came down with serious illness just at the point I was ready to, uh, to really uh, commit to shooting it. Uh, in fact, right now, uh, it's like I'm coming up on the the uh, second year after my major operation. I had a major operation for uh, throat and neck cancer. And thankfully, between, I had wonderful uh, surgeons, and, and between the surgeon and, and, and the care of my family and, and friend and so forth, I've recuperated uh, now, uh, over, you know, the second year, I'm, uh, you know, I've been cancer free, so I'm fine. But that's, that's sort of in a nutshell uh, where I've been, been doing. So I'm concentrating mainly in my own, my own, my own writing. Uh, let's talk about something that has always been your mantra, as long as I've known you, uh, the NEC days and beyond. And that is the term black theater autonomy. Uh, I, I think I know what you mean by it, but how would you define uh, what you mean by that, one, and do you think it has been achieved? And if yes, uh, when, by, by the NEC particularly, and uh, now? Well, basically the uh, term autonomy uh, simply connotes independence, you know, a, a being in charge, I mean, personally or organizationally, being in charge uh, uh, and without the imposition from uh, outside forces and so forth. So it's within, Auto autonomy comes from within uh, on a personal level and organizationally. It means that the organization is in charge of making independent decisions about what it does. Now, of course, in theory, artistically, that means that, that the organization is in total charge of the decision-making process of what it chooses to do and how it does it and so forth without 
in, uh, you know, in, in, in position from outside. Of course, I used it uh, in terms of the creation of an independent black theater, which became, uh, in, in, in historical terms, the creation of the Negro Ensemble Company. And uh, thankfully, uh, at the time that we created the, the, the Negro Ensemble Company, which was in 1967, the time was right and ripe for, uh, to get the support that was necessary to run a, uh, you know, a, 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 a major company uh, dedicated to doing uh, creative black work in, in theater and also training. Uh, and thankfully at that time, uh, I wound up writing an article uh, in the New York Times called uh, Black Theater uh, for Whites Only? Question. American Amer yeah, American, yeah, American Theater for Whites Only? Question mark. And then I, I, I proceeded to illustrate my analysis of our place at that moment and ultimately uh, uh, propose what should be and, and how, it should, how it should happen and, 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 and the, the, the form of the organization itself and, and what it could accomplish. Uh, but I, I knew that blacks' involvement in cultural movements at, w w you know, was lacking. And even then, that the only thing that would solve the lack would be our own independent activity. I don't think I was even using the word autonomy then, but I was using the term independent. It was already that, 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 that we had to do uh, for ourselves. And the only way that we, we would be able to change the situation would be to be in total control of our own destiny. You've always stated that you considered the black theater audience to be the most sophisticated audience in the theater um, and in the world. So I'm hoping that you could explain, what, A, what you mean by that, and B, expand on it in some detail, okay? Yes, uh, the black audience, in terms of, of, of my comment about the best audience in, in the world, uh, comes out of my uh, 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 observation, uh, especially now historically, because at the time of the creation of the Negro Ensemble coming that period, you know, 60s and, and even a little earlier, uh, there was no black, quote, legitimate theater audience, you know, in, in, in terms of, uh, that we know of. Uh, yes, black, blacks, there was a black audience, and it was cultured, and it went to, you know, uh, black cultural events. But as far as uh, conventional, serious black theater, playwriting, live theater, and so forth, uh, except for, you know, amateur Work YMCA, YWCA sort of activities. So there was no professional outlets. The field was not about them. The plays were not about them. The issues were not about them presented in the, in the plays. The aesthetic was not about them. You know, uh, we had a wonderful, as you know, we had a wonderful uh, popular audience for popular uh, venue music. And, 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 and vaudeville, vaudevillian type of thing. But there was no legitimate theater audience. So those of us who aspired to be legitimate writers, legitimate theater writers, so there was no public. What made me, uh, freed me as a writer was coming to the realization that I, I wanted to write for a black public that didn't exist. And I consciously wrote for a black public as if they existed. And I could uh, imagine them as an audience. And I could write as if they were there. 
this wasn't just a, a social idea. This was, this, was, this was an aesthetic idea. Because once I decided that I was writing directly for them, I didn't have to over, be over explicit. I could be suggestive as a writer. I could imply, I could suggest. They would fill in the blanks. Once I wrote for them as if they existed, I had to go out and get them and make a long story short. I did. See, what happened in the day of after when we opened the show, it wasn't enough for, for me just to have a show open up on convention or off Broadway. I had to say, okay, the audience that I need for this, I have to go get them. And I proceeded to use my organizational smarts to do exactly that. I went to where the black public was, trade unions, uh, social clubs, churches, and so forth, to get them. I wasn't satisfied. I don't care if the New York Times or, or, or Post or whatever the conventional uh, opinion makers, mainstream white opinion makers, whatever they say. They could have loved the play. I wouldn't have been satisfied if uh, only white people showed up to see, see, see work that I had consciously addressed, first and foremost, to a black audience. As I said, everybody really you know, can come. And it's not like uh, other people can experience our experience through us as creators. But what I found out is that once they came, the question you asked me is the most wonderful thing about it that I discovered is that they came with no preconceptions. They came with no educated sensibilities in the same way that we know that a middle bourgeois white audience comes after being taught what to think, how to think about uh, different aesthetic styles and so forth, or to be intimidated by their opinion makers, what the, what's the opinion makers say. And my, to sum up a black public, black audience, I say the only thing you can't, the only thing uh, that's unacceptable to them is if you put them to sleep. If you bore them and they go to sleep on you. Other than that, they don't come in saying, uh, oh, this is avant-garde. This is so forth. Now, we also have found out that the mass black public once exposed or uh, dragooned or, or uh, manipul manipulated to uh, the superficial aspect of their own culture and lives, like the urban, what was now called the urban theory, that appeals to their lo lowest, common lowest common denominator of instincts and, uh, 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 and, 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 and cultural appreciation that, you know, th they can be lazy too. You know, they can be uh, 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 not challenged. And they will go for the bad jokes and, 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 and the, manip you know, the, 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 the uh, conscious manipulation of their religious fervor and all that shit. Uh, so they can be used also. But what I'm talking about, the question you asked me is a serious public that is exposed to, to us as artists in our most serious intentions, where we intend to challenge them with whatever our exploration of their own lives and their own culture, challenge them by content and style. And as you know, even with, with your work, Gus, I've done a couple of plays like I've done what we got for me of yours. It turns out there's not a positive character in the whole play. That's what <laughs> And uh, I, even I was wondering, I said, okay, maybe you're know, maybe, maybe going to get upset with this so-called, on the surface, negative view of this black family's existence. But uh, no, 
the audience came in and and they 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 accepted uh this the the, 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 the overt uh expression of the play but they realized that there was a subtext underneath the play uh that despite its so-called negativity that it was a valid viewpoint and a statement that you were making without being explicit about it you were making a particular statement that hey rang true true to life and even the brother sister incest all that stuff they knew that hey that the specific details of the play uh, that you were using uh, had truth to it. The bottom line is that those that public, which had no preconceptions when they walk in the theater, and as I say, they will accept style, content, and anything else as long as the shit rings true. If today someone asks you to recreate another theater company, this is 2012, um, like the NEC that you created with uh, Jerry Crone and Robert Hooks in 1967, uh, what advice would you give them about going, to do, going ahead to do that? Uh, what would you emphasize? And what would you promote even? Okay? The irony about that question is, <laughs> is that sitting here in what? 2012, unfortunately, I almost would have to do the same thing I did before in 1967. Uh, now, there would be major differences. There are things that we accomplished, you know, that that theater accomplished uh, and we accomplished and what that theater accomplished led by us in that uh, we have a body of work that we didn't have when we started in 67. So now we have a body of work. We don't have to emphasize, let's say, the body of work. We have a wonderful, broad, spacious body of work. So thankfully, that exists. However, the question of an institution that was crucial and independent, as you asked me, autonomous. The first question you asked me, an autonomous institution that is required to sustain the permanent continuity, 100% exclusivity, focus on the creation and continuation and duplication and re replication of black work is we don't we don't have that. Now, there, is, there are a host of, of uh, community groups and black theaters you know, and so forth all over the country. However, there is no flagship institution operating on the same level of the Negro Ensemble Company. Negro Ensemble Company, not just because I don't mean this subjectively, but personally, as you know by now, uh, even when I talk about what I do, it's never subjective. There's always an objective component to it when I even talk about what we achieved, what we didn't achieve. It's not just a personal thing. It is an objective viewpoint. Negro Ensemble Company functioned almost as the flagship of the black theater movement because it was operating on such a... Uh, 100% temperature of that creativity, skill-wise, result-wise, craft-wise, challenge-wise. It was functioning, and therefore, it, and, and that was uh, uh, confirmed by its public, by its audience and, and even the, 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 the critical creative fraternity confirm the fact that what, what was being done was A class creativity on the level of A class creativity. And it was regular and it was continuous 
at least three or four players a year, season-wise. So whatever was happening in terms of what was considered to be black theater, hey, there was a flagship institution that, 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 that was always there. Now, when I talk about autonomy, I was the autonomy <laughs> of, of that institution. And all I mean, they're not public, not, not subjectively. This means a person. There has to be final decision makers, arbiters, selectors, uh, who make the final decision about what that institution does, how it does it, because what happens is they always say, somebody has to take responsibility for the failures. See, people think that you want to be in charge of a theater because you want the power to find a say so. No. That responsibility is on measure. Who's going to take responsibility when, when something fucks up or when something it, it doesn't work and is a failure? We have lost that autonomous institution. And if it had to be done all over again, there's no better roadmap or blueprint than what I laid out before. Uh, the training component I will still keep, even though we know now, like the body of work, that we have a cadre. We have a wonderful cadre of, of, of performers out there. However, the negative aspect of our present time is that the young black actors and even others aspiring to careers are doing it out of an ignorance that is stupendous. We were self-motivated with some idea, some sense of what we needed to do to, 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 to develop our own uh, chops out of our own background and culture. Hey, today, uh, if you ask them about whether they are auditioning or learning from uh, black material, it, it's almost you know, a blank. They still are ignorant of their own material. The, the, they're ignorant of the body of work I talked about. Well, I talked earlier about the body of work. The body of work is there, but they aren't even seeking to find out about it. So that many of them want to become actors, uh, once again starting 50 degrees before they even get to material dealing with their own lives or characters, uh, wonderful characters that have been created for them to uh, learn from. It's almost like we have to retrain the new generation in attitude, the same attitude that we took towards creating uh, an autonomous black theater in the first place has to be almost re recaptured, retrained, because they've gone backwards. Now, the other thing I would emphasize now for, to support that institution would be uh, a full-scale, all-out attempt to develop a subscription black audience. There's nothing that can sustain a black institution uh, independently but a stable black subscription audience. Because that's the only thing that can allow us creators the freedom. Not of a daily, not, not of a single ticket, not people coming for every show waiting to, for individual show, but a, a subscription audience that can support a season of four plays, let's say, and uh, sufficient enough, big enough, wide enough in a mass that we don't have to rely financially on what was available to us that's no longer available. The black wealth 
the individuals with black wealth have proved very disappointing. If they had come in to support something, an institution like the NEC, when I tried to get them, when the NEC was on, on the ropes, uh, we would still be active on the same level that we did. No, they disappoint me, and they will still be disappointed because their priorities tend to be different. Even those who are in the entertainment field. I tried to get those, in, I said, look, I, I know you're supporting the colleges and you're supporting your, your churches and all that, but just give back to your own field. But at the same time, the greatness, the great positive thing about what we did is that's there. We don't have to redo that. We, we have a body of work. We have living playwrights that still exist. So all we have to do is, is utilize them in a new, a new institution. Thank you.